uh, meeting to order. Uh, this is the, read the standard opening statement. This is the Conservation Commission for the 25th of February, 2021. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way, in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements, all meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Uh, today's agenda includes a notice of intent for shed and barn construction on Fair Street, uh, a review and approval of Mill River Greenway acquisition, review and approval of uh, Mineral Hills Greenway uh, future parking option, um, and any other business not foreseen at the time when the agenda was prepared. We uh, had minutes from October that uh, Sarah sent along. Um, uh, has everyone had a chance to read them? Someone want to make a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. And the second? Second. Uh, any amendments or modifications? No, that looked good to me. If not, all in favor. Sarah, you need a roll call? We do. Uh, Kevin? Yep. Mason? Yep. Jack? Yes. Jason? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? I was not there, so I'll abstain. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, so first, uh, first, is there any uh, public comment in, uh, separate from any uh, specific case that we're going to hear today? If not, we'll move to the first case. A notice of intent for shed and barn construction on uh, 43 Fair Street. Um, I see uh, Jeff, uh, are you representing the applicant today? I am, yes. So thanks everyone. Uh, Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group here on behalf of uh, Joe Jasinski, who I believe is also on the phone. Um, but I'll just sort of take you through the project. It's, it's a fairly simple, straightforward project. Um, and if I've got the ability to share my screen. Um, Give me just one second. I okay, can... sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, but essentially this is, okay, great. Um, let's see, what do I want? There we go. So um, hopefully everybody can see this yep. aerial image, but this is a um, residential parcel directly adjacent to the fairground property. The fairground offices are here. Fair Street, you can see um, running up and down the street and the barns associated with the, um, with the fairgrounds are across the street. Um, this, um, let me just do this now, um, bring you over here, okay. Um, so hopefully everybody can see, this is a Google Street View of the house, um, extremely flat site, as everybody knows, the fairground area on the fields down there. Um, the proposal is to relocate this shed that you see in the rear of the property to the left-hand corner of the site and construct a pole barn in this, in the location of the current shed. So looking at uh, site plan again, just orient you, Fair Street comes across the top of the page. Um, hopefully everybody, the, the plan sheet's up, I hope. Yep. Um, the existing I don't have shed, that one. Um, the existing shed is in the back of the property um, and the proposal is to construct a new pole barn in its location, move the shed to the other corner of the site. This area that you see hatched in the middle is where we're proposing to remove some of the soil and, and um, existing surface to accommodate some of the compensatory storage, which um, as you probably could see in the, in the letter, um, you know, this, this is a, a pole barn um, with flow through vents, but this site um, you know, doesn't allow us to provide compensatory storage at the upper elevations because there is nothing on the site available to remove. Um, we've got a, we've got roughly 1,600 cubic feet of volume that are being taken up by by this structure, and that includes all the walls and the posts. Um, 
any anything that is above the ground surface. Um, the interior is you know is, is open and clear. Um, doors on either end, so there is you know full flow through capabilities. Um, but as you can see from the images, you know there's there's nothing else other than the single family house to take down. So we're proposing to remove some of the topsoil to make up for that compensatory storage volume um, that will be um, trucked off site and um, hopefully a new a new barn in its place. Um, I think that's probably all I have to to say at the moment. Any questions, or comments from commissioners? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the, the glaring one is there's not foot for foot compensation, which I can understand you can't get from there, but um, there is a, a I think in the act it says you can also go elsewhere in the same floodplain to try to find um, where you can take comp storage from another area. Um, may be difficult in here. I'm uh, not sure how friendly the farmers are down there with each other. But, uh, mm. um, was there, was that attempt made? I mean, to try to find some other place where, uh, in the same floodplain where, where you could, that, could get yeah, that I mean, that, storage? The challenge, Mason, is the, is the only place, particularly down where the fairgrounds are, to, to make up some of that storage volume at the other, upper elevations is either through the removal of existing structures or getting into the that embankment that hillside that borders bridge street um yeah. because there's no there's no other you know it's it's completely flat down there where you know we've got three feet four feet of elevation change across the whole fairground yeah yeah um is there is there uh some sort of uh this is probably a question to Sarah. Is there an agricultural exemption for structures in the floodplain? Uh, there is, but this isn't a barn for agricultural purposes. So oh. we not qualify for that okay. exemption, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but if, if this exact same activity was proposed by uh, one of the farm properties in the meadows, it wouldn't be reviewed by the commission at all. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've always um, uh, wrestled with is if, if the goal is not to increase the horizontal um, dispersion or spread of flood water, then I never quite understood why um, the compensation had to be at each foot of elevation. Because if you, if you dug a hole, the water's going to go in the hole. And um, so. Right. And as soon as it fills the hole, there's no compensation. That was the reason why they went to foot for foot for the higher elevations. Because as soon as the floodwaters take out the lower, um, the, the, the old method was, okay, let's dig a hole, same volume as we're, we're, we're gonna put fill on the floodplain. But as, as soon as the uh, lower elevation hole that was dug to, for competition filled up, there goes all the compensation with the higher elevations. I see, I see, yep. And then this is, uh, this is uh, 16, 1600 cubic feet. It doesn't come under our exemption for, for minor um, projects in floodplain. That, that was my question and my concern. Mm -hmm. I'm not I might, sure. Was there DP comments on this? Or? Yes, Mark. Uh, Mark made comments, and he pointed out that dilemma, uh, recognizing that there aren't good places to uh, uh, take compensatory storage, um, but that it was not strictly speaking um, adhering to the requirements of the Act, the performance standards of the Act. Jason, did you start to say something? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. The first one I might have missed is there's no um, impermeable floor proposed here, right? It's just an earthen floor in the pole barn. Is that correct? Um, I believe there's a compacted gravel floor. Yeah. And then this is a question, I suppose, for Sarah. 
you know, long term, what what is to prevent the property owner from modifying the proposed compensatory flood storage area without some sort of like essentially a deed restriction? So the order of conditions would be filed at the registry of deeds. So that would come up in a title search um, and it would be a permanent condition, but it, you know, it's the same dilemma that the commission faces with, with any type of application. That there's no hard and fast um, prevention of a, of a homeowner or anyone subsequent from uh, creating future alterations. Anything that required a building permit would have to go through the building department, but short of that, there's not really a great checks and balance. Well, the, the comp storage is just for the thickness of the material because the building yes. is going to be allowed to flood? Yes, correct. Yep. So in the past, the commission has allowed um, the not foot for foot requirement uh, to not be strictly adhered to, but it's always been at an elevation lower than the, um, the material being added. This is the first time I, I think since I've been here that something has been proposed where the, the amount of flood storage um, is, is um, one for one, but it's not at the foot for foot and it's not mm -hmm. at a lower elevation. So the commission would essentially have to determine that this is a pretty much a de minimis amount and wouldn't have an overall effect on the floodplain. So you're the, sh that's the shed. Mm. Where's the barn again? Pardon? What, what is the size of the barn? Um, 40 by 30. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yep. <clears throat> um, what's going to be kept in the barn? I mean, because obviously it'll have to be moved. There's an imminent flood uh, with the flow through grates, uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, with the plan and everything. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I imagine it would be, I mean, Joe can probably speak more to it, but I imagine it would be, you know, yard equipment, farm equipment, you know, storage. It's, um, you know, any anything in the existing shed or house for that matter that, you know, would need to be moved if, if there was a flood. Um, I think that's probably always an imminent threat down there and they, the residents just need to deal with that. Yeah, um, we've dealt with, um, I've dealt with car dealerships that are in the uh, floodplain and uh, they have had to have a flood um, emergency plan where they have to, uh, state in a letter or something legal that what they're going to do with all the cars they have in the floodplain and where they're going to move them to and what out of the floodplain somewhere and you have to have a contingency plan. I realize it's just a single family uh, yeah. home, but um, hey, I, would hey, think, oh. I think they would want to move their stuff out of there somewhere and up, up out of the floodplain. Yeah, just going to say, Jeff, can you, can you confirm? I was, when I was looking at the net volume of storage, I know it's not a foot for foot, right? Um, but but the constant compensatory volume looks like it's coming roughly like that. The average of um, the elevations where where the the storage would be required is that. So yeah, Those so are the this... walls, right? Because the walls are providing what half. The, yeah, I mean, the walls, the walls and that, you know, that the structural composition of those are what take up the volume. So depending yeah. on, you know, where that falls relative on the elevation of the building, that's where, you know, there's, there's some larger structural, you know, components down at some of these lower elevations, which is reason for these numbers. But, you know, once you get above those, it's a pretty consistent. Yeah, no, I was just thinking from when we, you know, Sarah's comment about um, providing the compensatory storage at or below. The, the bulk of the compensatory storage is, is close. I mean, if you look at the, the volume below at elevations below that, it's sure it's, it's a quarter. 
which, uh, made, like I said, when I looked at it, it was was less of a concern to me. Sure. Can you, can you explain what the volume consumed below the surface is as a result of the foundations, or or what below the surface? Yeah. So there's there's some footings. Um, go to the plans, um, but there's there's footings. There's some post columns. Um, yeah, there's some of you can see the you know these these would these small you know spread footings would go down to frost presumably and there's a small you know four by four eight by one of these eight by eight by four posts and then when you're uh, taking some of that fill from the yard for the compens compensatory compensatory storage yeah. um, <laughs> Com the idea there is to right? that yeah. <laughs> That, that, that storage. Um, the idea there is to, <laughs> to take up approximately one foot between that 117 and 118 foot band across that whole area. Um, Correct. Not to, go, not to go deeper than that. Right. I mean, we're really just trying to scrape the surface to, to be able to compensate for that, yeah, that storage lost. Sarah, what uh, defines uh, agricultural use for a barn? Uh, it would be relation to a parcel that's producing agricultural products that meet a certain dollar production threshold. And since okay. this is just a single family home parcel, it wouldn't qualify. Right. So it's not the type of equipment storage that takes place or something. Okay. No. So I guess part of the, the question is, um, do we... Uh, do we believe this is a de minimis enough as Randy just pointed out, the, um, the, the, the parts that are at upper elevations are de minimis enough um, to say, hey, close enough, um, will allow an aggregate um, storage, um, some of which, as Mason points out, um, once it, things reach that level, any increment um, uh, does not have uh, compens compensatory storage. Um, but that if we figure, eh, okay, but you, you do have a compensatory storage for the lower levels and the part above that isn't big enough to, for us to worry about the further uh, distribution of floodwaters uh, horizontally. Um, that would be what we would have to conclude to say this is okay. Is that fair, Sarah? Yeah, uh, exactly. So the below the volume that's being uh, taken away it's topsoil, it's a 12 cubic yard loss. So it's 12 times as much as the commission's predetermined de minimis one cubic yard amount. Mm -hmm. Right. Sarah, if we, if we were to approve this, would it set any sort of precedent for other residential properties that are in the floodplain down there? Uh, it wouldn't. I and mean, every decision that the commission makes is on its own merits. So just because you, you're finding that if the commission were to find that this is a de minimis amount, given the particular circumstances and the, the level of the flood storage being provided, that wouldn't obligate the commission to make a similar decision in, in any future circumstances. And, and, and as far as, as conditions that we could um, place on this, if we were to approve it, would a feasible condition be to have something that verifies that the, the barn always has some kind of an earthen floor that drains that can never be paved or concrete floor or anything like that? Sure, uh, that can certainly be done. And there's really not a, a good way to check it until the property is sold. Right. Um, <laughs> but any, any good attorney will find that in a title search. And if it turns out that there's a, a change in conditions that would have to be addressed at that point. What, uh, uh, Jason, what's your um, thought about the, the difference between a pervious and impervious surface? My thought is that if there were ever a significant flood that were to reach that pole barn, you know, if it's just an earthen bottom, you know, it could feasibly be flooded and, and drain. Where is if it were paved or, or a concrete floor, you know, not dissimilar to the budding house. I mean, there's absolutely no drainage there. Mm -hmm. 
Jeff, can you go back to that uh, chart showing the foot by foot um, amounts? Yes. And, and can I ask this just a stupid question or what may be a stupid question? Sure. Um, for things like footings and stuff that are, are below ground, why, why does it have to be compensated for? Doesn't just because have to. Of, oh, it doesn't have to? No, if the, if the, if the uh, floor of the barn is at grade, Right. It's it's you know stuff below the floodplain is unless it's a cellar. Okay, I, could, and I didn't understand what the twenty four cubic feet and the twenty one cubic feet were that were at lower. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. clear on that. Either. Yeah, these 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 lower numbers up here probably don't need to be included. Okay. And Jeff, if you're showing anything that's below the ground elevation, are you, right. you're safe to take that out. You don't need to yeah. include that. Yeah, Which would then, yeah, so then then the amount uh, that's probably, what, what is the ground elevation there? Just uh, 118. 118. Yeah, uh, yeah so we're, we're really starting in about. You really, four. right. So, yeah. so the compensatory volume is actually at or below. Right, where it needs to be is that not correct? Yeah, uh, ba yeah. Based on, I mean, the the numbers that we're showing to be compensated for would be higher than, you know, what's required. Then you're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm more thinking that you know things that are buried like the footings and stuff like that don't have to be compensated for. And the way you've drawn it, it looks like the floor of the barn is at roughly at grade. Correct. Yeah. So so there may be some slight loss at the 116, 117 level, depending on yep. what the site conditions actually are. But anything below that shouldn't have to change. Right. Yeah, which makes me even more comfortable that this is. Yeah, that helps clarify my earlier question. And I'm definitely comfortable with, the fifth, with this 1598 or 1598 less everything under the surf below the surface at that 17, 117 to 118 band. Um, because for instance, if a flood comes up to 120, you still have more surf, yeah. more area, vo more volume, excuse me, that can absorb that flood water than you would have um, lost due to the barn. Sure. It, it, as, uh, as I understood um, uh, Mason's, uh, it, it, teaching uh, of helping me understand what, how the law is intended to work, um, that the supply is assumed to be infinite. So once it reaches a certain um, uh, level, then uh, it won't, because we have you know, uh, five times as much or 10 times as much or a thousand times as much as we've actually displaced. Um, uh, of compensatory storage somewhere, uh, it's assumed that at that um, elevation, it'll be completely filled. Um, and so um, what we have to consider is above that amount, is, is that amount diminished, which is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, times 112, so roughly 800 um, cubic feet. And that we've got a hole that's twice that size, uh, if we say the 1600 um, cubic feet, and that if, if in fact the, so on one lens would say, yep, that's twice as much as you need, so that's pretty good and makes me feel okay. The other lens would say, yeah, but if the incoming water is infinite in volume, then it'll get used up uh, no matter how big the hole is, and it's a question of whether you've then reduced the amount of uh, uh, storage available uh, at each elevation above that. As it happens, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I am comfortable with um, at each elevation above that having a relatively 112 uh, uh, cubic feet and having a bigger hole at the ground level because um, uh, it, it may well be infinite uh, when things flood or it might just be getting up to that level and then um, uh, flowing into the hole, so I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not worried that this is actually going to produce a greater dispersion of uh, floodwaters on a horizontal basis. 
And what DEP and the commission wouldn't want to see is the 1598 uh, compensatory volume from yard moved up to like the 124 to 125 elevation because if, if everybody in the floodplain did a project like that, that certainly would incrementally shift the flood yeah. elsewhere. But right. it, all, all the having it levels. below that right. is a better scenario. Yeah, if you use the 112, say for eight elevations, um, 117, Mm -hmm. 125, then you're looking at also 900 square feet rather than the 15, 1500, uh, which is you know, a significant change in, in sure. volume. I mean, it's still you know, above our, our standard, but um, it's a little easier to live with, I guess. Yeah. Um... It, it seems to me um, a, a reasonable. The question is, do we want a, a one to one or do we feel better if it's uh, right now, if they kept the 1600, 1598 um, and only displaced seven times 112, so roughly. Uh, well, um, it's, it's close to nine, or I, 96 I, or something. I, I came up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Like so about uh, 800 and, um, a cubic feet. So if you have a hole that's twice as big, or if you have a compensatory storage that's twice as much. Uh, well, the cellars at what, 117? Their um, floor is at 117? One, yeah, one, yeah, 118. This is the 118 contour right here. OK. Okay, so then yeah, it would be seven times. So if you're gonna go with the one eighteen. Okay. So I, 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 my impression is that yes, in some senses, this says uh, if we decide to permit this um, uh, with a couple of conditions, like a, a maintaining a previous. Um, uh, floor inside the, the structure. Um, we are allowing something that strictly speaking does not adhere to the performance standards of the act. Uh, on the other hand, and, and it's above our traditional cubic yard for a signpost kind of uh, um, uh, I was just thinking of the fairgrounds because we, we really, they, they did all they could to try to get it very close buildings and so right and I don't I I I, I guess what um, be interested in other other commissioners thoughts about this this seems to me to be above our de minimis uh, standard but um, it, there is compensation that could be greater I mean if we say hey if you if, if we're displacing um, 800 roughly um, cubic feet and you're uh, taking away soil to allow 1600 roughly, um, that uh, we're, uh, is, we're making a ruling that uh, says that if there's enough uh, uh, compensatory storage at a lower level, um, that it helps expand what we regard as de minimis. I don't know if other commissioners find that problematic or not, but um, I feel like that would be part of the argument would that would explain why this is uh, permittable. Yeah, I'd be comfortable with that. I mean, if, if it was a newer or larger development, but given you know the the pre-existing homes and things in that area, um, I, I I'm. I'm comfortable with that. Like I say, if, was, if somebody was thinking about doing the same thing, but putting in 400 new houses. Yes. Right. Substantial concern with that. Yeah, I agree there. I have a question on the grading. Is that gonna, is the grading gonna be going around the entire perimeter of the barn or just in between, uh, like in one section on either side? That was unclear to me. Hey, Jeff, I think that was a question for you. I just I was, I had a phone call. Um, <laughs> um, can you repeat that? 
Sure. The the grating to allow flood water into the barn. Yep. Um, is that going to go around the whole perimeter or just be in certain sections? Um, to go around the barn. So, I mean, there's no there's no um, you know real regrading that will happen directly around the barn, other than just you know taking out some of this you know soil for compensatory storage. This will re really you know just yes. be restored to existing grades. Sorry, I was to, I'm referring to the pervious grate along the side of the oh, barn to allow okay. flood, flood water in. Gotcha. Great those, team, yes. Yeah, Great so those team. will those will drop all the way down to the to the floor elevation. Yeah, I mean, they, and that they will be around the, the whole perimeter. Um, I don't know if it's the whole perimeter. Um, I think looks like one on each wall anyway. One on each wall. Okay. Yeah, if that. If that cross hatched is the, the grating, then in the center of each wall, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Is there a way we can put in the condition to um, to maintain that or ensure that that's that's consistent in there? Because if that grating is filled, then the, the floodwaters can't get into the barn, and then a lot more storage is then compromised. Um, well, so I don't Sarah, think they're going to be watertight doors. No, and there there is a front. Looking at plan view, there are two twelve foot openings on either end. Also, door openings. <clears throat> but yes, I mean the the um, you know so the the floodwaters can come in from either either end of the building in addition to the, the are, side walls. Okay. I just want to make sure that there's nothing that I mean it's not going to be completely waterproofed. Right. considering the construction of the barn, but to make sure that we don't lose more storage in addition to what we've been talking about because water can't get in quickly enough and and then the flood is receded by the time it does, it, it is able to seep through the little cracks that are available. Sure. So. Yeah, it looked to me like that with, if you have a, a two foot high by, uh, it looked like about eight feet or something uh, wide, that that's a, uh, um, that's a, a pretty that's pretty, big. pretty yeah. big aperture to um, allow water in, uh, ingress. So I think uh, I'm not worried about, even if you had the end doors closed tightly, it'd still flood as fast as any flood is gonna rise. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions, comments, um, discussions, clarifications? Well, we're on conditions. I, I mentioned standard conditions in my staff report just because I'm so used to doing it because there aren't any other resource areas involved besides floodplain. Mm -hmm. The only ones we really need are the permanent condition, um, noting that Conservation Commission review is required for any placement of fill, an as-built plan that's really critical for this one, and the, the one that Alec had just mentioned. But the other conditions really don't apply. Okay. Um, are there, I don't know if there's anybody on the phone or on the call that uh, has any comments um, before we close the hearing. If not, someone want to make a motion to close the hearing. So moved. And a second. Second. Uh, and all in favor of Sarah, you need a roll call. Uh, yeah. Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jason? Yes. Randy? Yes. Alec? Yes. So, um, at least those of us who have been talking uh, have been um, expressing relative comfort with allowing what's a, a, a failure to technically ad adhere to the uh, strict um, uh, interpretation of compensatory storage um, because it uh, does have this compensatory storage amount um, that's actually larger than what's being lost um, at a at a lower level and it's a relatively small uh, amount of storage lost above that level so is, is what does everybody else think um, uh, not everybody has spoken well I I think that the uh, Commission has worked very hard to try to accommodate this landowner and the fact that it's a small lot without many options left to the landowner. Uh, everyone was 
trying their best to uh, find a way to make it fit. Uh, it's a difficult situation. I was trying to let the people with more experience in compensatory blood storage uh, <laughs> do their thing. So I was really out of my expertise level, but understood the motivation for the landowner and the commission to try to find some solution. Right, we, we, we try to avoid uh, getting people on technicalities. Um, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we do have rules we have to abide by, but we have some, some flex. And uh, this is one of those cases that it, it's not quite so simple. Mason, where are you uh, at with uh, this? You're, you're the one with the longest tenure having and, and some of the deepest expertise on uh, stormwater stuff. Um, what do you think? Can, can you get comfortable with this or uh, is there some um, reason? Yeah, relatively comfortable. Um, I, I, I still think, you know, if, if there's, there's going to be equipment that's got oil and everything in it in the barn, it should be at least um, something in writing where um, this, this, you know, the, this stuff is going to be removed in the event of a flood. Um, I assume the family car is going to go tractor and take the other thing with you um, and get it out of the floodplain, um, mainly because it, it doesn't allow all the oil and gas and stuff to mix. Um, it, but it might be nitpicking. I, I don't know. I don't know what uh, the fairgrounds does next door. Um, I assume they have equipment that they, they get it out of there. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would think that might be stretching our purview because uh, if people just had cars parked in their yard. Um, yeah, uh, and yeah. So, but I think having a condition that there be an affirmative maintenance of the openings um, to allow yeah, uh, yes. flow, I think that, that kind of condition, yeah. I think we can. There are 60 square foot openings, and that's a, that's a good size. Um, I, I have one other concern I'll just raise. Um, for, as far as the as built are concerned, you know, so I think since we're dealing with such minimal um, elevation differences uh, throughout the project, can we can we request that the as built actually be survey grade and prepared by a professional land surveyor, as opposed to just like a, a drawn up plan yeah. like in the NOI? Yeah, that probably is a, a good added um, condition for uh, helping us feel comfortable that we're not just being sloppy about, hey, go ahead. Um, it's it's got to be actually professionally presented as uh, they've done what they said they were going to do. It might also be helpful to have some confirmation as to where the material is going to go. I mean, it's, they're just taking out the floodplain, but how do we know? <laughs> I, well, know. I think that's a little outside of our purview, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah well. Right, I think we, 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 we trust they said it's going to be removed from uh, the floodplain. Uh, um, I, I don't know where they're going to put it, but yeah. uh, as long um, as it's out of there, I think that, that's, um, that's what we have to worry about. All right, so um, someone want to make a motion to uh, approve the, um, the notice of no issue in order of conditions. Um, and Sarah has mentioned a, a, a couple of conditions and um, uh, we've added a couple of um, uh, clarity, uh, pieces of clarity to that, that not only an as-built plan, but a professionally um, developed uh, plan rather than the sketchy stuff that was in the NOI. Um, and uh, a requirement in the order of conditions that the um, uh, apertures on the building to allow uh, flood waters uh, 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 ingress and egress uh, be maintained um, in an open um, uh, manner so that uh, uh, the, the, the flow is not uh, impaired. Um, any other conditions that we were talking about during our discussion? Uh, permeable floor. 
No permeable floor, that's right. Uh, but it'd be maintained as a permeable floor so you get some kind of infiltration that can be. Um, and, uh, and I think um, maintenance of the uh, compensatory flood storage area to ensure that it always stays as as designed. Right, they don't fill it back in, um, right. That'd be a, a condition as well. And that an order of conditions will then be referenced or attached uh, to the deed. So as Sarah says, it usually doesn't come up until a sale, but um, it uh, will be binding um, uh, with this property in perpetuity. All right, someone want to make that motion? I'll make the motion. And a second. Second. Any further discussion? If not, roll call, Sarah. Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jason? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you, everyone. Okay, good thanks. Good enough. See ya. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Mill River Greenway acquisition parcel, Sarah. So this is the parcel that, that Wayne had mentioned in the uh, discussion about other projects that were going on at the last commission meeting. Um, let me just pull up the map. It's so small. Uh, so just to frame the discussion, this is the owner unknown parcel in Leeds that's sort of sandwiched between uh, the, the chart pack parcel and uh, other uh, conservation commission owned properties. And the, this area gets a lot of use in the summer and this sort of presents a, a maintenance and enforcement issue because it's, it's not owned by anyone, it is owned by the city, so we can't uh, conduct as many trash cleanups there as we would. We can't install improvements um, and no one can be trespassed from the area and we can't enforce additional regulations. So, Chart pack is, they're not out at Glendale Road, are they? Uh, no, they're on Mulberry Street. Yeah, Mulberry, right. Um, what are we talking, the Glendale Road parking thing or? That's another project. Oh, okay. All right. So the, the owner unknown parcel has approximate boundaries shown in green. Uh -huh. um, okay. Mill River's in blue. It's right along the bike path. Um, so it's sandwiched between the bike path and the, the Mill River. Um, the, uh, so chart, chart backs Street down in the lower is, left. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the uh, chart pack is River Road. Here. And that's the, um, that other the, uh, manufacturing site is the upper left. Yeah, um, on, on so River this- River Road, okay, got it. The, this break in the Mill River is the, the chart pack orange dam. Um, if anybody's familiar with the area, there, it's, it's posted as no trespassing mm -hmm. about until this point. Um, and the, the extent of the property goes to, to the north where the uh, bike path ramp comes in from Grove Avenue. Yeah, there, there, there's been a lot of uh, neighbor um, activism about people crowding in the summer and leaving a lot of trash and so forth up there. Yeah, so this is where the, the impetus for looking into this further came from. Um, it's been an owner unknown parcel for um, the, the city's tax rolls for many years. Um, I don't know if we've ever collected taxes on it. Um, so we're, um, what the, we're seeking CPA funds for this now, and we're working with Lead Civic Association who will hold the conservation restriction and um, have a, they, okay, an affirmative okay. responsibility to pick up trash and, and conduct maintenance there. So this, this should relieve the, some of the issues there and create some additional options and opportunities. There'll still be parking problems, but um, different issue. <laughs> different issue, right? All right. So you need a uh, yeah. Go ahead and see if you can buy it. Uh, ruling from the commission. Yeah, 
um, so it's not, this one's a little bit more complicated since it's- Oh, great, right, because it's- um, you can't So we're not it. actually purchasing it. We're yeah. putting the assessed value of the property or the appraised value, uh, if that comes out to be lower than assessed, which we anticipate it will, into an escrow account. And that it basically just sits there forever in case a, an heir of the property ever comes forward and makes a claim to it. So we just pay, take it by eminent domain and put that escrow aside? Yep, um, so more of a friendly taking. Friendly taking, okay, great. Um, and I know I saw Councillor Mayori here. I don't know if she wanted to mention anything about this property. Yes. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. And also I believe that Jason Johnson from the LCA might be here as well, but I can't uh, see everyone. Uh, but yes, um, this would be a really a, a great help um, for uh, the area, you know, for Leeds and for this area because um, we're in a frustrating position of trying to kind of protect the riverway and the lands and find, and and regulate uh, use of the recreational use of this area, and um, we can't do that when it's when no one owns the land. Uh, we've gotten chart pack on their own land around the dam to do some pickup trash pickup and such. But this would be the first step for us really being able to, to take, to steward this land. And we have, I, I, if Jason is here, he can tell you, but I can tell you that uh, the LCA and um, other volunteers, friends of the Northampton Trails are all committed to um, putting up signage and regular uh, pickup. Um, so I think it would be good in, hand, good, in good hands and uh, it would help, uh, it would help the situation there which is getting worse every summer, frankly. Right, right. Somebody sent around a video last summer that was, it looked like a, a, a huge party going on, so. Uh, yes, yeah, that's not, a little unusual for lead, so you can see why it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's been bad because of the pandemic, but we expect it will just get worse because, for, frankly, because of global warming, I think the temperatures are gonna be higher. Yeah. Um, and we just we need some we just need to try anything at this point to the situation is untenable as it is. Great. And if the commission remembers a few years ago, you made changes to the land use regulations to specifically address the Mill River Greenway and Leeds to allow some additional enforcement to take place there if necessary. And with having this owner on known parcel directly adjacent to it that people can just move to regardless of the right. limitations on the green line, it just doesn't make sense and it makes things really challenging. Good. You need a, a, a vote from the commission? Uh, so you'd be uh, voting to approve the pursuing the purchase and to move forward with the Domain okay, so I want to make a motion to that effect. Moved. And a second. Second. Any further discussion or comment? If not, roll call vote. Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jason? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. All right, you're here. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mineral Hills Greenway, um, future parking option. Help so me understand. One, I, I, I read the, your your uh, staff report and I wasn't sure that I understood it after reading it. So to... It was something that we'd, we'd forgotten about for probably the last 30 years. Um, so the West Farms Conservation Area, which you can see on the little map I threw in the, the staff report, um, it's on the right. So it, that's south of Route 66. Um, I don't actually know how we came to acquire that. And I, I think this might be the only conservation parcel in the city that I've ever been to. Um, it doesn't really have any access. It, it's tough to get to. And there, there's not really much there to see as a standalone. If we expand uh -huh. it in the future, it, it could have some great trail opportunities, but. At the moment, it's just an orphan kind of by itself. Um, so when when this was acquired, we retained this other parcel, um, not for conservation purposes, just for general city purposes. And that's shown on the staff report as the 
the parcel directly to the south of it with the frontage on Glendale Road. It looks like a driveway opening. Yeah, it looks like uh, I think there was going to be a subdivision there or three or four houses. Yeah, uh, I think so. Um, so this one was retained by the. Uh, it was like. A yeah, I, I think it, when. Yeah, when some of the houses on Route 66 were built, I think this constant, the uh, Parsonsburg Conservation Area was a, a result of that. And then this surplus parcel was retained for a future um, limited development sale. Um, mm -hmm. And when that happened, the city retained a right to put a parking lot on the parcel. Um, but now that we are get, getting ready to move forward with the sale of the property, having this sort of strange retained right to build something that we never are probably going to build is complicating the sale of it and making the title not very clear. Um, so we're moving forward with a vote with a city council order to make sure that um, not removing the right entirely, but making sure that it's clear that we won't put that parking area on the, the driveway access portion. And I'm looking at your the, the page that you sent. What's the square area of the parcel, the, the, the parking, parking part of the parcel? It's not very, it's not very big. The retained right didn't specify how large the parking area would be. Mm -hmm. um, how large is the conservation area? Both of those shortly. Hang on. So the, the surplus parcel is one and a half acres. And the open space parcel is uh, about 12 and a half acres. I was going to say, it looks pretty good. So, is, is it possible to ha have some kind of a deeded access through that surplus parcel to the conservation parcel? There is another access to it. Um, I see. So we don't actually need it there. There's access to it from Route 66. And, and I, there's a separate um, access through the parcel that isn't shown on the map. So that already exists, but this parking retained right is separate from that. I see, thank you. And so what, we're not actually relinquishing land, we're relinquishing an option. Correct. And that, that will not inhibit the eventual conservation use of the rest of the parcel. It will not. No, this was never intended to be a conservation yeah. parcel. Okay. Hmm. All right. It seems like cleaning up old stuff. I think Wayne had done this with thinking that um, there might be some much larger conservation area development there that, that never happened and mm -hmm. it can't happen now at this point. And we're, we've also shifted away from being in the business of making parking areas because they're expensive and a, and a maintenance headache. Right. All right. So uh, that require a vote? It does. And the uh, motion would be to relinquish the parking option for the uh, whatever the title of that parcel is. Is that the Hannum Brook parcel? I don't know. Uh... Uh, I think it's, I think this is the split. This is Parsons Brook. Parsons Brook parcel, okay. Sure. Relinquishing the uh, parking option on uh, the Parsons Brook from parcel. The, and only from the driveway portion. So we could, we could still in the future build something on the frontage of the parcel, but not where this resident decides to put their driveway. Okay. Motion, someone want to make a motion to that effect? Uh, just one clarification. So do we now, we own that little parcel with the frontage right on Glendale Road? Uh, it's a city parcel. It is not a conservation parcel. So the conservation commission doesn't own it. Oh, okay. So that would, that would require article 97. And it would have to go to the state legislature, but it's not owned by the conservation commission. Someone want to make a motion? Move. 
And a second? Second. Any further discussion? If not, uh, all in favor, roll call, Sarah. Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jason? Yes. Randy? Yes. Alec? Yes. All right, thank you. Good. Anything else, Sarah? Anything we need to rule on uh, that you've acted on uh, in between meetings that need to? Nope. Uh, no emergencies. Nothing else for me at this point. Good. Um, I sent an email uh, with the latest annual report from uh, Broadbrook Coalition. It, it's really uh, always impressive to me, the annual reports they send. I mean, we have these, uh, as uh, we we're just learning that the lead civic is gonna take the um, management role for the parcel that we were just talking about uh, along the uh, bike path um, in Leeds. And they do a great job in other places as well. Um, and the BBC is you know, I th our, our largest, I think it's about a thousand acres now, the Fitzgerald Lake area. Um, uh, it's our largest conservation area and they do just a, a remarkable job, which is part of why in a subsequent meeting, we want to see if we can help them with their dog complaints. But at this point, um, uh, not addressing dogs, but just uh, it's uh, a, an, an impressive feat. They map the number of volunteer uh, hours that they generate for everything from pulling water chestnuts to getting rid of invasive uh, 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 land-based uh, species to uh, maintaining trails to uh, it just it's in, incredible and they do it year after year and so I, uh, I, I in, encourage that we uh, uh, that everybody read that report and it may be I've, I've thought about it, it may be a nice um, note if we as the commission uh, and uh, sent a letter to the Gazette kind of thanking uh, Broadwell Coalition as uh, along with other uh, partners that manage conservation land and providing a link um, in that letter for their annual report. Because I think people just, everybody loves Fitzgerald Lake. Everybody takes it for granted and is unaware of what it takes to keep it in the shape that it's in. So uh, I, 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 I'll give some more thought and I won't act on it without coming back to all of you, but I think it might be good to try and publicize that a little bit. Anything else? Sarah, when's our next meeting? Uh, next meeting will be March 11th. All right. Good. Anything else anybody got that needs to get said before we close? All right. Thank you all. Good to see you. Um, see you again on March 11th. Take care. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.